again welcome on let's talk africa uh, and uh, today on the show we are discussing uh, african women and youth inclusion in politics and governance and uh, today we are privileged to have a guest all the way from nigeria uh, honorable uh, chikas kumle she is a politician and also an activist in nigeria so uh, let me just welcome her honorable chikas welcome on let's talk africa good day sir alan and thank you so much for having me on let's talk africa it's a pleasure to have you and uh, i don't know how it is there but this side you know we're enjoying the the nice weather the sun is out and uh, everyone is out enjoying so this is good nigeria is cool as well wow Wow, wow. We would love to be in the seat of Lagos. So on, on this on the show, we are discussing, you know, uh, this great topic, Africa women and youth inclusion in politics. And uh, you are somebody who is a pol in politics and you're also an activist. Uh, you know, so this should be, you know, something that, uh, you know, uh, you're also passionate about to make sure that, uh, you know, we empower women and uh, we empower young people so that they can also be able to participate on high level in either politics uh, or uh, governance to make sure that, you know, uh, we, 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 are, we are moving towards an Africa that is more inclu inclusive. So today also on Abochikas, it's, uh, um, it's a world day against child labor. So I just wanted just to, as, as we are starting our discussion, for us also to remember this so that uh, we can also maybe find a, a time just to discuss on, um, on, on what we can do to make sure that, uh, you know, we are playing a role as well to end, um, you know, child labor in the world. So let me just welcome you. Thank you once again. Yeah. So and I'm always excited to speak about women and youth involvement in politics fantastic so just let's just just start by uh, you introducing yourself my name again is chikas kumle i am a politician and social justice advocate from nigeria i am also a belgian plus 25 eaglet at the un women passionate about politics mm -hmm. and very active in advocating for the rights of women and children Wow, that's that's fantastic and that's impressive. And uh, you know, we need more people like yourself in, in in politics. So you know, if you look around in many African countries, women and youth are often you know marginalized when it comes to political you know uh, inclusion or polit political participation. So do you think women are given a fair shot in this modern modern society? Absolutely not. And let me start by saying that politics itself, being a powerful, powerful system that affects you, whether you take part in it or not, because the decisions there goes on to affect the society. Women specifically are so highly marginalized, especially in Africa. Mm. And this has to do with the cultural and sometimes the religious interpretations, which suggest that women should not be seen directing or controlling resources and even managing people and then here we are talking about politics which is a game of power mm -hmm. so most times women are marginalized not because they are incompetent but because of their gender and even at face value some people uh, from my experience simply just want to judge you because you are female and they feel women don't have a space in politics mm -hmm. and also talking about uh, how people grow up from the family unit. Girls at that level are not exposed to see themselves as being leaders, but the boys are encouraged, they are supported, and also given the space. In the African culture, the woman is mostly seen as being good for mm -hmm. being in the kitchen mm. and being at the home front. Mm. And in some cultures, again, where men are seated, a woman should not be allowed to stand up and speak. It's mm -hmm. seen as being rude. Mm -hmm. So some of these factors goes on to affect how the politics is being played out. And in the long run, their involvement in politics and issues of governance seen to the marginalization of them and the lack of having them on the table also affects the kind of policies that are made. Mm -hmm. So in 
in in some terms when we're talking about the development of africa or yeah. the advancement and growth of africa i always say is because we simply have left 50 percent of our capacity i do mm -hmm. and we've ignored that great reservoir of knowledge and experience mm -hmm. So the involvement of women in politics is very important, as well as the involvement of young people, because they are the majority and they have, they should have a say in how they are governed, mm. being that most countries here practice democracy. And yeah. democracy is a government, it's a system of government for the people, by the people and for the people. So if it is a system of government by the people, then the majority should have a say. Yeah. And half of that population are women. Yeah. And then over 70% of that population are young people. So it is very important that in conversations about politics, leadership and governance, women should be included and not just given the space. Women's ideas and perspective should be taken seriously. So women are very important in, in politics. Mm -hmm. Youths as well are very important in politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, a few things that you mentioned there, you know, you mentioned that women are often, you know, judged in society. And also we have these cultural barriers which are there to restrict women from, you know, achieving, you know, what they want to achieve or even, you know, going higher in the ranks, in society ranks. So how can we break these cultural barriers to make sure that the right of women or a, the right of a girl child are protected first i think consistent advocacy and awareness creation to the gatekeepers of our culture and to women and youth themselves first to the gatekeepers because they are the custodians of culture and traditions mm -hmm. when we make them understand why we need to bring in women and youth and make them understand why this system of governance is important for improving the standard of living of people and also improving on the delivery of good governance mm. then they will be the ones to support that these women should be given this the space in some instances where women have shown the competency and the capacity to lead those custodians of culture happen to be the loudest voice that shows up to support them mm. and that has gone to show that if there's advocacy um, and awareness creation to these custodians of culture, then it will help. Also, we need to speak to women and youth themselves yeah. because politics is so tough from my experience. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not something that you just close your eyes or you microwave and see it happen. You have to work and be involved in all its processes. Mm -hmm. So we need to speak to women and youth themselves to have interest in politics. Because someone not having an interest in politics, it will be difficult for the person to sustain the fire, to sustain the passion, and to be able to go through all the challenges that comes with the struggle for power. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we need to uh, get women and youth to understand how politics works, and they need to understand how to get politics to work for them. Most yeah. times we get to see them going out, they make campaign um, promises, they help politicians to go around to campaign but at the end of the day the promises that are made to them and then the campaign energy that they've spent and so much engagement that they've made does not result in real term development yeah. example yeah. in yeah. some places we still struggle with access to basic necessities of life mm -hmm. like we don't have infrastructures we still don't have power mm -hmm. we, we still have people who don't have access to education and as we're celebrating today, we, it, ref, it brings our mind back to how so many people, like children now, to mm. be specific, are still out of school. Yeah. And then yeah. we still have so many people that are above the age of 18 that have not had any form of access to education. And here, politics, giving people the opportunity to be in power, making laws, implementing law, uh, policies of government, to better the lives of people now means that putting women aside and mm -hmm. not giving youth that space will mm -hmm. only keep taking us backwards. Yeah. And most times if I'm talking about uh, child rights, um, child rights acts and other policies that comes 
from parliament. Mm-hmm. It is women that always seem to push for those bills. Mm-hmm. Not because the men don't care, but because women are naturally nurturers. Yeah. So they understand the challenges that comes with raising a child. And mm-hmm. also as a young person, you've lived within that age bracket and you experience what it means living in your country at that particular time. Yeah. So you'll be in a better position to understand what these children are going through. Yeah. So um, it is good that today we're having this conversation. And again, we are celebrating this day mm-hmm. to reflect on the need to have an inclusive society where Mm. everybody is given the right Mm. to access to basic necessities of life and also ensure that the rights of children Mm -hmm. are guaranteed yeah that's that's true and uh, you know when we talk about uh, power as you uh, right just pointed out there when we talk about power we talk about majority because you know uh, people to get in power they they need people they need a lot of people to put them in power. And uh, now, when we look at the composition of uh, uh, the, the African society, we have a lot of uh, young people and a lot of women compared to those people that are representing us who are, you know, um, of a, 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 a certain age, you know, that is not uh, classed as youth. So why is it that uh, the youth are marginalized in this way that you know they're just used for campaign they're used just to uh, hand clap or they're just used to propel this politician in power but once they are in power they forget about the youth well, how do you see that first it has to be with the perception and the stories that they've been told while growing up uh, growing up here first thing you hear is that politics is dirty so mm-hmm. people get scared of involving in it or mm-hmm. engaging or fully participating in it yeah and then secondly you get to hear that politicians are thieves mm. so that culture that we grew up in not wanting to spoil your name and mm. be called bad men people tend to shy away from that and then for women they are mostly seen as loose women let me use that word they are mm. not respected by the society mm. and so for also for young people People feel that as a young person, you lack the experience. So Mm. what are you going to be leading people about? Mm. And so most times for young people, especially in this climb, Mm. who are are struggling with the issue of um, underemployment and majority of them are still unemployed. Mm. And then here we are talking about politics, which is very expensive. How do we get them now to engage in it? They don't have the financial resources. Mm. They don't have the funds. Mm. And all of those um, financial engagements that come with politicking. So youths at that level, because they are still struggling to have a source of living, Mm. those old politicians now take advantage of them. Mm. In some cases, um, they drug them and then use them for violence. And so that violence in itself scares a lot of people away from politics, Mm. knowing that you can go into it, but you can't be sure or certain of, how you're going to come out of it. So yes, the financial challenge is there and also the violence in the politics. But it's it's changing now because a lot of conversations are around the youth quake where young people are beginning to ask the question, all my life I've been in this country, I've seen how things are working in other countries via the social media platforms, but why, why is it not happening in my country? And mm-hmm. you begin to see young people take to the streets, mm-hmm. challenging their leaders, mm-hmm. seeking for involvement in politics. Like in Nigeria, we have we now have the Not Too Young to Run bill, which is signed into law, now giving more young people access to the political space mm-hmm. so that in their 20s, in their early 30s, they are qualified by the constitution to hold certain powerful offices in government yeah. and so some of these things across africa mm-hmm. is now enlightening young people to see that yes if this african country is doing it mm-hmm. then we can make it happen here so the challenges that uh, exist in politics i always tell people it also exists in business because every good thing comes with its own challenges and whatever it is that you're doing you should expect that there should be some level of resistance in it. So when we're talking to young people or when we're talking to women about the involvement in politics, Mm -hmm. it is good to give them a first-hand experience and how the reality is really out there 
so that when they are coming, their expectations will be right and they'll be well prepared to engage the political space. And yeah. just like you rightly said, mm. people need people to put them in power. And already the young people have the numbers. If mm. you're over 70 percent of the population, you can dictate what happens, mm -hmm. whether at the federal or state levels. Yeah. And also, uh, we have the numbers to see that we negotiate. Mm -hmm. Because if you have over 50% of the population, it then means that you can negotiate for power with whoever wants to become president yeah, yeah. and whoever wants to become either a governor or a senator. Mm -hmm. And that is important because negotiation is part of politics. Yeah. And when young people are taught to negotiate appropriately, then when people get into power, issues of unemployment or infrastructural deficit will be a thing of the past. Because mm. governance is important uh, in the sense that it should be seen. It shouldn't just end in promises. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all of the factors that young people and all of the challenges that young people face, I believe they are surmountable. And with time, young people in Africa will really be bold to address mm -hmm. this sit tight syndrome that we've seen with most of african leaders mm -hmm. some have been in power for over three decades mm -hmm. some some <laughs> it, it's almost like they are unchallenged mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, yeah. it's not good for a, mm -hmm. a growing and a developing country yeah yeah so and uh, the the issue of governance is uh, is also you know very crucial uh in, in when we talk about uh um uh young people and women inclusion uh, in politics so how can we make sure that uh, you know we are including governors in our debates when we're talking about women um, young young people and youth and women in, in, in involvement in politics well i i feel for issues of involvement it has to do with um Having a quota system mm -hmm. that deliberately increases their number is important. Mm. And also having people to understand why certain things should be in place. Mm -hmm. Because policies of government, like I earlier on said, is what governs the society, the laws. Yeah. And then if these laws have direct or indirect effect or impact on the people, the people themselves need to understand how to engage the system. Mm -hmm. So... Political literacy is very important. People must be made to understand how their own country works because we have different systems running mm. now. Yeah, yeah. When we have people understand what really works for them, it's mm. going to be easy for them to engage it. Mm. And then demanding for good governance is a basic right. Yeah. It shouldn't be seen as people are out fighting the government. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over time in Africa, we've had military regimes where mm -hmm. people are not um, given the space to question what happens yeah. with their leaders. But yeah. now, being that democracy is widespread and widely practiced, people are now beginning to understand that we are the ones who put these people in power mm -hmm. and they are there to serve us. Yeah. And that yeah. brings us to the point of accountability. Yeah. Once people are in power, they should be held accountable mm -hmm. for their actions and all other things that they do that affects the people. So the people here, for me as a politician, is important to engage them, mm. to understand how they need to demand for good governance because it is their right. Yeah. And then seeing that those in power control huge resources, these resources are for the people. And for the sad part that we've seen over years, people looting the commonwealth of the people mm. and then taking money out of Africa to mm. other developed countries. Mm. These are the kind of things that people must be enlightened to question. Yeah, yeah. You must yeah. begin to question your leaders. What is happening? We know that Africa is a rich continent. Mm -hmm. Why are we where we are? Mm -hmm. Why can't we have good roots? Mm -hmm. Why can't we have health services and quality education for our children? Mm -hmm. And all of this will now bring people to understanding that indeed people in power are there to serve them. Yeah. And the delivery of good governance is their right. Yeah. They should demand of it. Yeah. Thank and, you. And also looking, just uh, looking, uh, staying on the same topic on on the governance. You know, I was just looking at um, um, uh, Africa, the African Union, and the, one of the African Union's agenda towards 2063 is promoting Africa of good governance, and this is amongst the seven key aspirations listed in the African Union. 
uh, agenda 2063 titled the africa we want now what kind of governance structure or model should african countries adopt to achieve this because you know we have seen that uh, um, the model of governance that we have followed over the past it is it's, it's, it doesn't it doesn't work because we're still seeing issues of corruption we're still seeing uh, countries that are supposed by now they would have been you know developed there are still countries that are backwards so what model of governance should africa adopt well um being that africa is a continent of over 54 countries mm -hmm. some of the regions have over the time past shown that there's a model that works for them mm -hmm. while in some other regions it has been proven that there's a certain system that works for them mm. but widely it is acceptable that democracy is what brings in the power to the people mm -hmm. it's what gives people the power yeah. and ability to question what happens with their resources and what happens with um the commonwealth of the people so it's a good thing that the african union is having this great vision and the projection of what it wants to see for africa but uh, there are given uh, there are clear examples that we've seen in the past mm -hmm. where we had people who overstayed in power but they had the ability to make things work in their country for example libya mm -hmm. libya was working with when gaddafi was there mm -hmm. but gaddafi was a dictator mm -hmm. and immediately the west invaded libya libya has collapsed now mm -hmm. conflicts different regions and all of that mm -hmm. and in other sec uh, part of the continent like rwanda we've seen where paul kagame has been in power since uh, after the genocide in 1994 mm. and now rwanda is one of the fastest growing economies in africa mm. we've also seen that across other countries and so that has shown to us that democracy thrives where the people are empowered to question the government mm. and democracy gives people a sense of belonging mm. where their voices are heard so the model that i believe africa needs to develop and adopt and sustain over years is the one that the democracy is transparent because one of the challenges like you mentioned is where people beginning to question the system whether it is transparent enough mm. or whether their votes are counted mm. and so even in nigeria people sometimes don't want to go out to vote not because they don't believe the system but they begin to ask themselves if i go out to vote will the votes count? Mm. And so to have a system work, it is people who control the system. The people must be made to understand that if you ensure accuracy, if you ensure a level of transparency while conducting elections, while supervising elections, then it will lead to us having the true voice of the people reflected because mm. it is wanting to have the majority vote and then it is another thing to have the person who got elected to be announced. Yeah. And so Africa needs to move beyond the level of imposing candidates on the people. And that brings us to the point of Godfatherism. Mm. Sometimes people want to exert excess influence, mm. trying to impose a godson or a goddaughter mm. and enforcing those candidates on the people, whereby they are not even accepted in most cases. Yeah. But yeah. because they have other selfish agendas, they get this, those people in power and they, at the end of the day, they don't get to perform. Mm. So once we get people enlightened, helping them to understand the essence of governance, then these issues will be addressed. And again, if we do that, people themselves will not be afraid of the godfathers because mm. money has always been a factor yeah. playing yeah. out in that. And then they are taking advantage of the fact that some people are poor so whatever it is they get during elections, they feel they are entitled to go out and vote for a particular person. That is why currently uh, there's a lot of enlightenment to people that once people pay you money to get them into office, mm. it then means they don't have good plans for you. Because leadership should not come by who becomes the money back. It yeah. should be about service. Yeah. Leadership yeah. is about service. Absolutely. And so the people who have the capacity to mm. serve should be voted for and should be supported to get into office and not 
uh, strictly supporting people because they have money to give. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, well, well said there, Honorable. And uh, today, uh, as I said um, when uh, I was introducing you on the show, that today is World Day Against Child Labor. And uh, Africa is one of the continent where we see child labor, uh, you know, as a common practice in a lot of countries, even those countries that are rich in mining. You know, we have, we have seen um, the footage, as I don't know whether you have seen on this side, we saw footage um, of young people uh, in, I don't know whether it was Angola or somewhere where young people are being used in mining, you know, as, as small as even uh, five, you know, used to carry heavy stuff, working, you know, around the clock. So how can we fight against this uh, child labor in Africa to make sure that we are also creating you know, uh, um, opportunities for young people, even at an early age? Sincerely, child labor in Africa is a sad reality that we're living with. Just like you said, in countries where they are rich in minerals, then we've seen an increased number of uh, the exploitation and maltreatment of children, using them as child slaves. If we're to get out of that, we need to have countries to make stiffer laws and make sure that those who get children into child labor are punished. Uh, there was a documentary I saw where people were covering up. When mm. they see the cameras or they see people trying to interview the children, mm. they send the children away. And then at the end of the day, the children still get back on those fields working. And in most cases, these children happen not to attend school. So they are deprived of access to education. Mm. And in some sad cases these children die and no justice is rendered to their families or anyone or any guy then yeah. and this is something that we really need to work on because these children are the future of the continent mm. and a future that is so maltreated cannot mm. grow up to be productive yeah. and for countries that are importing products that they know come from child labor they should make laws to ban the importation of such mm. so that the businesses that other people thrive on the back of those children will no longer be visible. And so when uh, we make policies and make laws that punish people for crimes, it makes it a lesson for those coming behind not to repeat that same thing. And so for child labor, it is a very terrible thing that African continent needs to get on its toes and address appropriately and also bringing us to the fact that africa is richly blessed mm. it shouldn't be that these resources that africa is so blessed with turns out to be a cause yeah the young generation should be allowed to thrive let the wealth that the country is blessed with not turn out to be a burden on the country yeah and so for countries that have gold diamond cocoa all of these things are meant to enrich the people mm -hmm. and not to enslave them. So yeah. child labor is something I'm so passionate about advocating that children should be allowed to be children. Children, every child has has the right to access education. So education is a basic right. Yeah. Yeah. Government must ensure that they make policies whereby education is free for children. So irrespective of their social class, whether they are re from rich homes or they are poor, they should have access to education. And those hours that they get to spend in school will take them off those mining fields. Yep. And in the long run, they, the people that are exploiting the children, having access to them and enforcing them into child slavery will not be available. And then the children themselves will be enlightened to know that, yes, there's a future ahead of me. There's somewhere I'm heading to. And so education enlightens them, it broadens their mind, and also builds in them the passion to see that their country becomes better. Yeah. So yes, we are celebrating today, and it's a good thing that Africa also has this on their table, but they need to be deliberate in implementing these laws yeah. to see that the African child becomes the future leader that we desire. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, now, um, just moving on, um, now, um, when we talk about the African women and the youth inclusion and governance, um, I think we should also not forget the role of those people who are Africans, but they are outside the country. 
uh, in the diaspora. So how significant do you think the diaspora are uh, in promoting African, African governance? The diaspora, I believe, is important in promoting good governance delivery in Africa because even at face value, when you travel to advanced countries, people get to contrast and compare mm -hmm. infrastructural facilities and services that are available. Yep. And so when people in diaspora are exposed to such uh, environments, and then they begin to reflect on what is back home in Africa. Then the question of, okay, why is it not happening in Africa? Mm -hmm. Despite being a continent so rich. So the diasporas, I believe, are very important. When we have the diaspora involved in politics, they should be paying attention to what happens in the politics in their different countries. If you are from Malawi and you are in the UK, you are in the US, wherever you are, mm. always pay attention to what happens back home. Yeah. Whether you are a Nigerian, and it shouldn't be that, okay, now I'm in a different country, so whatever happens in the continent is no longer my business. Mm. The diaspora needs to pay attention to the politics back home. And in cases where they can influence decisions, please let them be there for the people. Because sometimes the people on ground, because they are not exposed to what happens in advanced countries, they don't know that these things can be available, that yeah. these things are doable. Yeah. So those in diaspora are so enlightened. They are the ones now that will tell them that these things, we've seen them happen in other countries. And then they will even give them points and areas of focus where they can make these things possible. Mm -hmm. So the diaspora is very important. Like uh, in Nigeria, to be specific, more remittances are made back to Nigeria. More remittances have been made back to Nigeria in the last two years than the country had made through foreign direct investment, which then now wow. tells you mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the economy is greatly influenced and sustained by Nigerians in diaspora. And I'm mm. certain this is what happens in other African countries as well. Mm. So which now tells us that the constitution of every country should be the one that allows those in diaspora to have a say in it. Mm. Even if they cannot vote, there should be a level of engagement that yeah. they should be allowed to have access to. So they'll be able to decide who a good leader is for their people. Because mm. wherever you are in the world, you are still an African and you will still be seen as such. So any form of politiki, any form of uh, political participation that happens in Africa, I greatly believe that the diaspora can improve and advise people appropriately. Wow, fantastic, Honorable. And uh, I just want to give you this quote, which... Uh, um, uh, it's, it was said by the former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. Um, he once said, I quote, Good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting development. Um, yeah, so do you agree? How do you see this? How do you see this? Uh, this, 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 this what he said? I completely agree because good governance is what drives societies to thrive. Mm. So, yeah. so it's important to, to, to have people believe that and also understand that him being a UN Secretary General, he has seen the globe from different angles. And for him to come up with that tells us that indeed we need to stick to the question of demanding that good governance delivery becomes a reality for everyone. So I completely agree with Kofi Annan. Yeah. Now, let me just ask you this now. How do you see Africa as we move forward? How do you see, what's, how, how would you focus Africa the next 10 years? And uh, what are the areas you think um, uh, people who are in positions of influence in Africa should focus on to make sure that, uh, you know, um, Africa as a continent moves, you know, um, ahead and become one of the uh, big power, you know, because we saw, we have seen uh, the EU, you know, uh, having a seat at the, G, uh, at the G7, but Africa is missing there. No African country, no single African country is 
on G7. But Africa as a continent, we should, at least as African Union, we should have a seat at the G7 and influence global issues. So how do you see Africa in the next 10 years? I absolutely agree with you. Africa mm. is a huge continent and we have a good market space that the globe takes advantage of. So we should have a seat on the G7 table. And not just because uh, of our population or just because of our potentials, but I believe Africa has so much to bring on the table. And I see Africa in the next 10, 15 years as greatly being advanced because education has helped people and it has exposed people to be involved at the level where things are no longer being tolerated. Things that were done in the past are no longer being tolerated, like dictatorship, like people amassing wealth for themselves while being in power. So in the next 10, 15 years, I believe people will be making quality demands and deliberate efforts to see that things that we get to see in other advanced countries are here on ground in Africa. And again, I'm glad that we started the conversation about the involvement of women and youths. Mm. This is a demography where this is a huge constituency where if they are involved and given a seat at the table, it will not just be that we having them because of their gender or their age, mm. but we're going to be having fresh ideas on the table. We're going to be having fresh perspectives. And these are important because we need an Africa that is industrialized. We need an Africa that is well-structured. We need an Africa that is advanced and having people have a better standard of living. So yes, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. I see a developed Africa. I see a very fast growing continent. And being that our population is projected to be the youngest population of over 400 million by 2050, mm. that is a huge market. That is a huge market where the entire world will be paying attention to because we have the workforce, we have the human capital resources, and we also have the natural resources wherein if we are carefully implementing and directing our energy to progress, then these things will become a reality. So Africa is a blessed continent. And I, I believe strongly that the democracy that we're advocating for and the kind of politics we're involved in will evolve as well. It will evolve over time in the sense that people will engage in it not because of what they want to get, but because it offers them platforms to serve their people. And again, I will say Africa is a blessed continent and the entire world will be paying attention to Africa because it has great potentials to impact the global markets. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Honorable Chikas, now we have come to the end of our discussion. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to say or any advice to the young people, you know, who, are, who have lost hope young people who feel like they've been let down by politics, young people who feel like, even women, who feel like they've been let down by the system. And uh, what message can you give them to empower them, to make sure that, you know, they still believe that there is light somewhere? I would say to the women and young people out there to believe that this Africa that God has blessed us with is ours for us to build. We should engage the system, not to run away from it. Yes, those things that you've mentioned are a reality. People have lost hope. People are losing hope in the system and no longer want to, in, to pick interest or even want to be part of the conversations about politics because over time they've been made promises, but those promises didn't come to fruition. So I'll tell women and youths, engage the system, be involved in the processes that brings in people into leadership and ensure that you galvanize all forms of support within and outside to see that you get a seat on the table. Already we've mentioned on this show, you have the numbers, you have the, the demography and the energy that is needed to get you a seat on the table. Negotiate appropriately and make sure that you understand that in the game of politics, it is a game of power. Power is not given. Power is taking. So go out there and take back your power. You must engage in issues that affects you. Some, somehow we have some countries that are 
bedeviled by conflicts. Some are going into famine and so many other things. I believe strongly that this thing happens over time where a greater number of the population is not being given the attention needed. And in some cases, their ideas are not taken seriously. But when we have young people and women on the table, it will help to shape policies. It will also help to see that laws are made in such a way that advances the cause of the public. And the young people especially, I would say, they should not let anybody deceive them mm. that they lack experience. Mm. I always say this, that nobody is born with experience. Yeah, and as a yeah. young person, you have the intelligence, you have the intellect, you have the capacity and the energy needed to govern. And so they shouldn't let anybody deceive them that because of their age, they lack the experience to lead. Mm. And to women, that their gender is not a disadvantage. That you're a woman doesn't mean that you should be laid back. You should be out there speaking and ensuring that your voice is heard. And at the end of the day, women and youth need to form a formidable force. Yeah. Because in political movements, you need the numbers. Yeah. The women and youth need to understand that they are so marginalized and they need to form formidable movements that will get them a seat on the table and ensure that they also negotiate to have those things that they want. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you very much, Honorable Chigazande. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you. And we always have a, you know, great, you know, you always give us a great insight uh, on, uh, you know, uh, how we can move forward. And uh, um, I'm hoping, you know, I'll bring you again at some point and we'll talk about another topic. But uh, thank you very much for coming on Let's Talk Africa.